Have a seat. That means, just as the sun takes away the darkness of the whole world, as soon as it rises, in the same way, Sri Raghunath Ji will remove all our pains and sorrows as soon as he appears in front of our eyes. In Hindi it means, जैसे सूर्य देव उधर लेते ही सारे जगत का अंधकार हर लेते हैं उसी प्रकार श्री रघुनाथ जी हमारी आंखों के सामने पड़ते ही हम लोगों का सारा शोक संताप दूर कर देंगे नमस्ते आई पुना दशवंत कर ऑन बिहार फॉर वाल्मीकि स्टडी सर्कल एक्सप्लेन द वॉर्म वेलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू एट द थर्ड इवेंट ऑफ भारत वंदे मातरम सम्मान सीरीज आई रिक्वेस्ट आर डिस्टिंग गेस्ट डॉक्टर कुंडार एस जी वाल्मीकि स्टडी सर्कल कन्वीनर अर्जुन आनंद जी and co-convener Riyah Shah Ji to do Sri Ganesha of this Samad by doing the Prajwal. Hari Om Sri Ganesha Yenavaha Sri Saraswati Yenavaha Sri Vera Purusha Yenavaha Hari Om नमोगत पताई नमोगत पताई नम प्रमत पताई नमस्ते सुलंबोद्रा एक गंता एक विभिन्न प्रदेशीलाए सिव 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 सुदाए सिव वर्धमूर्ताए नमः हरि ओम जो जान्ति रंधक चक्रम जान्ति प्रदेवी जान्ति राबा जान्ति रोग नया जान्ति बंध बताया जान्ति रुष्वे देवा जान्ति ब्रह्म जान्ति जवकुम जान्ति जान्ति रे व सामा सांति रे दे जतो यता समी हसे ततो नो अभयं करो सन्ना कुरुपया यो भयं ना पसुविया सुसांतिर भवतो इट इज अ मैटर ऑफ प्रिविलेज फॉर मी टू इंट्रोड्यूस यू टू आर एस्टेंड ग्रेस पीपल Dr. Kumar Ayes, born in 1959 in Duvan, Belgium, in a Catholic family. You have obtained MA degrees in Sinology, Indology and Philosophy. Dr. Ayes has worked as a journalist and columnist in foreign affairs, mostly freelance, punctuated by stints as an assistant in Belgium, Senate and as a guest professor in two reputed universities of India, Indus University, Ahmedabad and Sanchi University of Buddhist Indic Studies, Sanchi. Due to your extensive and well analyzed research in oriental studies and especially your then dissident findings on Ayodhya, you were made a target of cancel culture, cancel culture. But your research has opened the doors for many forwards for Hindu assertion. Your PhD dissertation is packed with original information on a topic usually monopolized by under-informed but over-opinated academicians. It has been published in the form of two books, Decolonizing the Hindu Mind and Who is a Hindu? Presently, your focus is more on Hinduism itself, the, itself than on the Hindu pro movement, in keeping with the emancipation of our Hindu intellectuals ecosystem from the latter, as seen in your latest literary work, Hindu Dharma and the Culture of Wars. But you have also written on very different themes, altogether 30 books and numerous papers and contributions to collective research volumes, also in your mother tongue that is Dutch. Most conspicuous here is your pioneering role in the Aryan Homeland debate. Su Swagatam, Dr. Els. I now request, I now request Satyam Vats Ji to felicitate Dr. Els with a memento on behalf of Valuity Study Circle JNU.
I now request Manish Ji to felicitate Dr. Vita Shripal, a symbol of Mangal and Kalyan in Bharatiya Sanskriti. Thank you. May I now request Arjun Anand Ji, doctoral candidate from Special Center for the Study of Northeast India and Valmiki Study Circle's convener to inform us about the vision and mission of Valmiki Study Circle and, and to brief us about the Bharat Bande Matram Samwal series. Namaste. Valmiki Study Circle uh, was founded in 2019 and it is striving for the Bharatiya Karana popular discourse in JNU. जवाहरलाल नेहरू विश्वविद्यालय के प्रचलित विमर्श के भारतीय कर्म को हम संकल्पबद्ध हैं एंड इन दैट टू फुलफिल दैट गोल वी वी ऑर्गेनाइज मेनी डिस्कशंस वी ऑर्गेनाइज डिस्कशंस वी ऑर्गेनाइज इवन एसे राइटिंग थीम्स में वी राइट वी वी पब्लिश बुक्स टू 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 फर्दर दैट गोल एंड इन दैट सीरीज वी हैव अ फ्यू सीरीज टू 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 फुलफिल दैट गोल एंड वन ऑफ द दैट इज भारत वंदे मातरम संवाद श्रृंखला सो भारत वंदे मातरम संवाद सीरीज बिगैन With some with certain questions that arose in our mind when we started reading Sri Aurobindo's works, uh, questions like what is Bharatiya? What does it mean to be Bharatiya? What does Bharatiya Karan entails? So certain questions like these, how can we uh, make sense of such a diverse, such a diverse civilization? How 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 do you how do we define the word Hindu? So such questions you know uh, and forced that uh, forced us to uh, delve deeper into. These things, these discussions. And the first discussion was on Bharat Mata. Why do we refer her as as a Devi? The second discussion was on the manufactured fault lines of Bharat. Uh, the first discussion uh, we had as a guest speaker, uh, Shashank Tiwari ji. In the second discussion we had J S I Deepak ji. And in the third discussion today, which is organized in the memory of the great intellectual yoga, Sri Sita Ram Goel ji, we have with us Dr. Kohli and S G. I I welcome you, sir. Uh, we are humbled by your presence uh, interestingly we are going to publish a brochure or a kind of a vision and mission document of valmiki study circle and in that document we are coming up with 30 contemporary bodhik yogas contemporary scholars who have not got their share of uh, fame or we can say that they have not got their share of uh, recognition from the popular academia and one of them is present with us here today and we are we are very privileged we are we are We are feeling uh, बहुत हम सार्थक महसूस कर रहे हैं अपने कार्य को कि आज हमें यह सौभाग्य प्राप्त हुआ है थैंक यू वेरी मच सर थैंक यू ऑल फॉर कमिंग हेयर नमस्ते दिस संवाद इज बीइंग ऑर्गेनाइज्ड इन कमेमोरेशन ऑफ द ग्रेट ग्रेट बौद्धिक योद्धा सीताराम गोयल जी इज आर इंस्पिरेशन आर बीकन ऑफ सात्विक प्रकाश इन द तामसिक अकेडमिक वर्ल्ड इज एमोनाइज बाय एंटी भारत फोर्सेस May I now invite Somya Verma ji, who is pursuing her master's in philosophy, to present a review of the intellectual biography of Sri Sitaram Goel ji. Uh, 
uh, he saw what a brotherhood between Hindu and Muslims around his neighbor. Then, uh, uh, then Ari Samaj critiqued uh, Quran. Uh, he, uh, the Ari Samaj said that the Purana should be burned, but uh, but Sridharam Goel didn't agree to it because when he read Srimad Bhagavad Gita, he got attracted towards Sri Krishna. Then comes the last of Sanatanist. He started hating Sanatanist, but when he met Gandhi and he saw that Gandhi is working for uplifting Harijan by uh, Harijan Ashram, he, uh, Gandhi uh, had a lot of, like, uh, uh, lot of lunch uh, for the Harijans. The upper class people used to serve lunch to the lower class people. So he got attracted towards Gandhi and then he moved from being an Ari Samajist to a Gandhi follower. But soon uh, a controversy broke out between Subhash Chandra Bose and Gandhi on the topic of socialism. So he got diverted so towards socialism and then he got converted into Marxism after reading a lot of literature on Marxist. First was Communist Manifesto and second was the two volumes of Das Capital by Karl Marx. Then in his college uh, he met Ram Swarupji who was one year senior to him in his college. So what happened that is, while discussing about Marxism with Sita Ram Goel, Swarup agreed with Marx's theory regarding the role of class conflict in human history. But Ram Swarup raised two vital questions. First was, how did classes come to be constituted in the first instance? Second, how did the facts manage to appropriate the means of production? According to Swarup, classes were the outcome of national conflicts in which one group of people conquered and imposed itself on another group and misappropriated the means of production. So for him, national conflicts had primacy over class conflicts. For example, during India's independence struggle, the national conflict with British colonialism had primacy over whatever class conflicts that were present in Indian society. This way, Ram Swarup used Marxian concept to outflank Marx itself. But then also Sita Ram Goy was heading full steam into communism, but a novel by Huxley called Time Must Have a Stop broke his Marxist spell. It said that the roots of social evils lay ultimately in human nature itself. A desirable order could not be built out of the desired soul of man. So it is after this remark that Goel's journey of renouncing communism began. So we will see how was the journey of Sita Ram Goel with Ram Swarup. So Ram Swarup did not impose his critique of Marx on Sita Ram Goel. He asked Sita Ram to read lot of literature to which he can himself think why he should critique Marx rather than imposing that you should critique Marx. So he asked him to read uh, a book by Dalin and Boris named Post Labour in Soviet Russia. He was stunned by seeing the photo stats of identity card issued to inmates of post labour camps located all over the Soviet Union. So Goel concluded after that the premises of Marxism and Western capitalism are not much different. Both were based on materialist worldview, evolutionistic sociology, hedonistic psychology, practical ethics and consumerist economy. In both cases the end goal is the same that is the economy of abundance. So by then, by then Goel has denounced Marxism as an inadequate system he realized that communism uses cultural vacuum to its great advantage. It derives support from a deeper source of new self-alienation amongst the political and cultural elite. Then Goel thought that Nationalism could be used as a potent antidote against communism, but Swarup had a different view of that. Swarup said, foreign should not be defined in geographical term. Then it would have no meaning except territorial or tribal patriotism. To me, that alone is foreign which is foreign to truth, foreign to Atma. It touched some part of Goel's heart. They withdrew their anti-communist campaign against, they believe, that to save the nation from the corrosion of its soul, they have to fight a more significant battle couched along deeper cultural contours. They became more and more meditative by them, especially Ram Swarup. His discussions were centered around the Vedas, the Upanishad, the Gita and the Mahabharata. 
Swarup initiated goal into Goryeo into meditation. He makes him understand the true meaning of dharma. For Goryeo, dharma was a matter of moral norms, external rules and regulation, do's and don'ts imposed on life by an act of will. But Swarup made him see dharma as a multi-dimensional movement of man's inner law of being, psychic evolution, spiritual growth, and spontaneous building of an outer life for himself and the community in which he lived. Goyal's philosophy of three generation of Indian society has four premises. First, Sanatan Dharma is not only a religion but also a whole civilization which has flourished in India since old ages but is now struggling to come into its own again after a prolonged encounter with several sorts of predatory imperialist ideologies like Islamic and British colonialism in pre-independence or communism in the post-independence era. Second, Hindu is not a community but constitute a nation. Muslims and Christians in India are our own people but who have been alienated by Islamic and Christian imperialism from their ancestral society and culture. Third, Bharat Vars has been and remains the Hindu homeland par excellence. Hindus have never laid claim to any land outside the naturally well-defined border of Indian society so they should never concede that Afghanistan, Pakistan and Bangladesh ceased to be an integral part of Hindu homeland, which is the idea of Akhand Bharat in both today within India's right-wing movement. Fourth, history, history of Bharat Vaj is the history of Hindu society and culture. Hindus created a unique civilization which dominated the world of millenniums. He ended his book by quoting, I had come back at last, come back to my spiritual home, from which I had wandered away in self-forgetfulness, but this coming back was no atavistic act. On the contrary, it was reawakening to my ancestral heritage, which was waiting all along for me to lay my claim on its largest. It was also the heritage of all mankind as proved by the seers, sages and mystics of many a time and line. It spoke in different languages to different people. I could not resist its call. I became a Hindu. Thank you for listening. May I now have the proud privilege to request Dr. Ernst to deliver his talk. Dr. Ernst, the stage is all yours. Okay, uh, where am I going to do this? Okay. Uh, the PowerPoint should be the first one will be the shoulder. Okay, but do I have them on screen at the same time? Buddhists are often known as navel gazers. 
And in the case of Zen Buddhism, this is literally true. The Zen technique consists in concentrating on a point just below your navel and uh, corresponding to what in the Indian chakra system is called the Swadhisthana chakra. And uh, so um, the navel is quite important in Buddhism. The Buddha also had a navel, which means that he had parents. You see, people born from, from the gods, you see, they don't need to have a navel. And so the Buddha is part of the lineage. So, in the case of the Buddha, unfortunately, it's not taken seriously in the sense that nobody asks who his intellectual father was. Like you just learned that uh, even Sitaram Goel and it from Ram Sarup and a little bit from Aldous Huxley and others. Well, you see, in the case of the Buddha, somehow he fell from the sky. When Buddhist studies started in the mid-19th century, European scholars projected a few uh, Christian ideas onto it. Namely, you have the memory, you see, it started among Lutheran scholars in Germany. So they had the image of Luther reveling against the Pope. Other Christians also had the idea of Jesus reveling against the Pharisees, or even of Moses, uh, I wouldn't say reveling, but at any rate, being hostile against the worshiper of the golden calf. So all those uh, comparisons are made with Buddhism standing against the ugly vicious Brahmins. Um, and um, even Richard Gombrich, one of the best Buddha scholars today from Oxford, uh, tends to make a similar comparison. Buddha is totally original, although he admits he himself maps where the Buddha quotes from the Upanishads. But he says, yeah, but that was only ironical. Well, we'll see about that in a later stage. But the first fact to notice is that the Buddha quoted from the Upanishad. You see, it didn't fall from the sky. The Ambedkarites similarly claim that the Buddha had it all, that he was totally against the Brahmins and so on. He was a rebel against the Vedas. But so, as rebellion is still a form of relationship, you see, some people think that there was no relation at all. It's a step farther away from the Vedic tradition. So, um, people like, for instance, Philip Maas, a historian of early yoga, claims that yoga was generated by the Buddha. It didn't exist before, the Buddha invented it, and then the ugly Rishis Hindu Brahmins stole it. Hmm? Yeah. So that's impressive, you see, the Buddha was an incredibly creative person and an entire civilization is indebted to him because it couldn't invent anything itself. Um, so all these uh, different uh, schools of Buddha scholars are in agreement that Hinduism is the problem, Buddhism is the solution. Hinduism darkness, Buddhism light. Or at the very, very best, the biggest concession they're willing to make, Buddhism is the preparation, uh, sorry, Hinduism is the preparation, Buddhism is the completion. <coughs> Another very common use of the Buddha is as part of the Aryan invasion theory. So some people say he was an Aryan invader. This was when the Ar Aryans were still the good guys. So it was in the British period. The Nazi, car-carrying Nazi indologist Walter Rust said that the Buddha was a great Aryan personality of antiquity. Ah. And so Aryan invasion believers see him as 
identifying with the heritage of the invaders. Uh, an earlier uh, racist historian from Britain said that the Buddha was the only man of our race, the only Aryan, who can rank as the founder of a great religion. And Buddhism is the only essentially Aryan faith, faith which took its rise among advancing and conquering people full of pride in their color and their race. A slightly milder, more modern version of essentially the same thought is by uh, my late colleague Christian Lindner, who said that um, he brought, uh, or he represented the tradition brought by the Aryan invaders, namely Aryan humanism, which contrasts favorably with the ugly, vicious, indigenous superstitions of the Brahmins. But then you see when the Aryans went out of favor, and anti-Aryan was the thing to do, then you see many people came up with the theory that he was a rebel <coughs> against the Aryans. He was a preserver of the native traditions that had temporarily <coughs> been superseded by the uh, Aryan traditions, but they came back. Mm, so this Shramana tradition lay dormant and subdued for a period of almost 1,000 years after its political and economic bases were destroyed by these incoming Indo-European peoples, peoples, but it survived in peripheral and refused areas of India until it started reacting against the Vedic people and their culture. So this is now the received wisdom. Everybody believes it. And so... Um, I don't. Sri Kantala Devi, the mastermind of the Art of India theory, writes that um, it is this much is true that Hinduism is partly the descendant of non Vedic centers. So the Vedic tradition is only one of the tributaries of what became known as Hinduism. This was essentially the tradition of the Paurava tribe in Haryana, which was then gradually taken over by others. But Greater Magadha, present day Bihar and Eastern UP, was another center. And so it started overlapping with the Vedic tradition later on, when the Vedic tradition spread eastwards after the desiccation of the Saraswati River around 1900 BC. Um, but nevertheless, it had its own traditions. And so some of this you find back in Buddhism and especially in China. So this militates against the now common view that Hinduism stems from the Vedas. It partly stems from the Vedas, but partly also from other sources. Like, for instance, the culture of Murtis and Mandirs that we now have is non faith The belief in reincarnation, which is absolutely central in Buddhism, is non faith The Chandogya Upanishad describes how it was adopted as a completely novel, as yet unknown view. I'm not inventing anything, this is what the Upanishad says. Okay. So the idea that uh, the Vedas were the source of everything is in fact very congenial to the Aryan invasion view. You see the Aryan invasions came, they settled in the northwest of India, there they wrote the Vedas, and then they moved to everywhere else in India, taking the Vedas with them. So that's not what happened. Johannes Bronckhorst, a Dutch historian working in Switzerland, um, so said that the Buddha was a typical, was a representative of the culture of Greater Magadha. Now, he made the mistake of ignoring the largely and recognizably Vedic background of the Buddha. Um, so the, the 
first culture center really was the University of Takshashila, which existed before the Buddha. Several of his friends had been studying it. So you see some people claim in the name of Buddhism, because everything good in Hinduism comes from Buddhism. So they claim that the first universities were Buddhist. In fact, the first university was Vedic in Takshashila, where Panini um, worked. Uh, so that whole aspect is minimized by Bronco, so that's a mistake. But otherwise he is correct that there is a cultural element in Greater Magadha that is not big. However, to what extent the Buddha was representative of this is very much the question. At any rate, the idea of rebirth and asceticism was native there, much less in the Vedas. Go a little bit in the Vedas too, like the birds, uh, you know, one bird is picking the berries from the tree and the other bird is only watching on, which is, and which in the Upanishads is explicitly explained as an image of the difference between uh, Nirvita and uh, Savriti. Uh, yeah, Nirvita and Savriti. The Buddha himself never claimed originality. He said, I walk on the path that the earlier Buddha saw. He was fitted into a role that existed much before. He was already predicted to become perhaps a great ascetic at birth. In the classical story of his four meetings at age 29, he meets a sadhu who is happy, who is not afflicted by the miseries that the three others are. So not only did the role of an ascetic exist, it was even successful. Even that he didn't invent. Um, and so everybody thinks it's normal. They know the role of an ascetic. According to Buddhist sources, he had two meditation teachers. You see, he experimented a bit, like for a while he was an extreme ascetic, something we now recognize as a giant, where you see he didn't eat anymore and he could count his ribs and so on. Um, but so one thing he did was to learn meditation under teachers. You see, these are the shoulders he stood on. So you had Alara Kalama and the, after that Udaka Arama Putta or Udraka Arama Putra. And so they were experts in Pranayama and in Dhyana, in meditation. And they taught him two advanced meditation techniques. One is staying in nothingness. Nothingness or emptiness is of course a concept that nowadays is uh, associated par excellence with Buddhism. And so it existed already earlier. He learned it from others. And then there's a technique of neither perception nor non-perception. So he mastered these techniques. He didn't have anything more to learn from his teachers. So he moved on. In fact, the teachers asked him to become their assistant, to also start teaching these techniques. But no, you see, he wanted more. Why? Well, because he alone had this idea that meditation serves to get rid of suffering. You see, this is not necessarily so. I mean, ask people who do meditation, do you do this in order to get away from suffering? Maybe a few will say so. Like, for instance, in the West, you have the very typical case of divorced women who later in life when their attractiveness for men and so on is not what it used to be, then they start doing meditation, you know, to, to fill up the emptiness in their lives. So that, that happens, of course, but nevertheless that doesn't necessarily happen. Like many young people, you see they are adventurous, they want to see life, like they come to India for example. But then they discover meditation and they say, hey, this is it. 
And then they start doing that. Not because they want to get away from anything, not because they want to get into something. So you see, if these people move on, it is not like you read in modern introductions, totally at variance with the source text, that he did this in disgust. On the contrary, you see, it is a case of what Friedrich Nietzsche said, you don't honor your teacher by remaining his pupil. Moreover, he remained friends with these teachers. Nothing discussed. And so after he himself found his own way and reached what he called Nirvana, then immediately he sent for those teachers. Hey, I've got something that will, will, will interest you. Come on, I'm going to show you. So, you know, he remained very much friends with them. And more especially, the two techniques he learned the two meditation techniques are still the two most advanced ones in the Buddhist curriculum. But he retained them. Uh, personally, I've been uh, very fortunate that I've known important people in my life. Um, when I briefly studied in Varanasi, uh, there were a lot of activities in the nearby uh, Tibetan Buddhist University in Sarnath. So I got to know the vice chancellor there, and uh, that was this, uh, this Lama Samdong Rinpoche. And uh, so after serving as vice chancellor there, he retired and he wrote a very good book on meditation, where he writes, the Buddhists had no special methods which, they could, which could be described as purely Buddhist. But they have several insights that are specifically their own. For instance, on the nature of shamatha, or calmness of mind, and vipassana, or alertness of mind. Mindfulness, as they say nowadays. But the techniques are derived from those known in the Sankhya, Vedanta, and other Hindu schools of philosophy, and perhaps in other religions which teach meditation. So the yoga that Shakyamuni practiced was already old. It was borrowed from others, learned from others, but he made sense of it in his own way. So um, again, this Rinpoche says that uh, the teachings about Samadhi are similar, technical terms may be different, but the stages and the systems of elimination are essentially the same, are common to all the ancient traditions of Indian meditation. Although meditational systems may differ in the beginning, they all correspond to each other in the higher stages. Right? So in identity politics, Hinduism is a badge of separate non-Hindu identity, but in meditation is very much part of Hinduism. So let's see some Vedic elements in Buddhism. Nothingness, which he learned from others, is of course the same thing as Shunya in Buddhism, it's very Buddhist, and a thought form neither perception nor non-perception is easily traceable to the Rig Veda itself. You may know about the Nasadhyaya Sukta. Nasadhyaya comes from Na Asad. It is not not. You know, neither non-being nor being. Okay, now that's a typical Buddhist thought form. You will find it all the time in Buddhism. <laughs> then um, you find key Buddhist notions in the Vedic hymns, in the Upanishads, or in the Shanti Parva, which is the earliest explanation of Sankhya philosophy. And um, they contain notions like renunciation, like the holographic paradigm. In the Atharva Veda, you have the notion of Indra's net, Indra Jala, which means, you see, a net where in every knot there is a diamond that reflects, as in a mirror, of the entire net. You know, so that, in modern terms, is called the holographic paradigm. 
A well-known example of it is your own genome. So every cell contains your entire genetic code. So you see, if you, if you study that genetic code, you know how to read it. You can see in it what it says about your brain cells and your muscle cells and so on, even though you're studying a stomach cell or a cell from your hand or whatever. So every cell contains the plan of your entire body, the whole brain. So that's already there in the Atharva Veda. Yeah, the idea of reincarnation, of course. The basic problem of suffering. You saw in Buddhism that becomes very central. That's not true elsewhere, but it is already acknowledged, like in the in the Upanishads. Um, the poisonous nature of desire, same thing. In some cases, you could ask the question, which was first? Like, for instance, in the Yoga Sutta, you have the notion of the four Brahma Viharas, uh, Maitri, Karuna, Mudita, and Piksha. And so that you also find back in, uh, in, in uh, Buddhism. So Brahma Vihara is more or less translatable as divine states of mind. Uh, but so, just as well, is it possible that both Patanjali and the Buddha had it from some older common source? It's clearly part of this pan Indian meditation teaching. The word Arya is used by the Buddha all the time. Uh, and so, um, he speaks of the, um, the Four Noble Truths, the uh, Satvari Arya Satyam, or the Noble Eightfold Path, the Arya Ashtangika Marga. This word Arya really means a Vedic restoration. Why? Well, the word Arya came to mean Vedic at the time. Some people translate it as noble. This is somewhat anachronistic. You see, just like the English word noble, which originally means a sociological term, referring to the upper class, to the dukes and earls and so on, and only later gets a moral meaning of generous, magnanimous. Uh, um, so the, the same evolution takes place in India, and um, it is probably preposterous to say that it already meant noble in a moral sense. I think it still meant noble in the sense of upper class. Um, the Buddha takes Brahma and Indra as witnesses when he's going to uh, propagate his own findings. He quotes from the Upanishads. He calls his own path Dharma, just what Alara and, and Rama, or what's his name, uh, Ramaputra, yes, do, um, just like Hindus do. Um, then, there is a passage in his life called uh, The Seven Precepts of non decline <coughs> uh, One of these is to respect all the existing religious customs. You see, if there's a temple, you have to keep it alive, go visit it. If there's a festival, you have to celebrate it and so on. He was not a revolutionary, he was a conservative. And he wanted the existing religion, which is mostly Vedic religion, to be practiced. Uh, some people say, ah, yeah, but his choice for the vernacular against Sanskrit, now that's anti-Hindu. Now, <laughs> you see, at the time, he wanted to preach to the people he <coughs> had in front of him, so he preached in the local popular language. But he was not against Sanskrit, that's not said. Um, and his, uh, his followers choose Sanskrit. Why? You see, not because anybody forced them to do it. No, because it was far more practical. You see, when it was a local tradition, they could use the local language. But soon it transcended that. Why? You see, unlike Mahavira Jina, unlike Charvaka, um, unlike Mahavira Goswami, um, he had the support of the princes. 
And so they built monasteries for him all over India. Why did he have the support? Well, he was one of them, first of all. He had proven his political capability. You see, he was a member of the Shakya Senate from age 20 to age 29. And um, what he had that others didn't have is that he was neutral. Once he had become a monk, he had no vested interests anymore. So his advice was far more reliable. It was not subtly calculated to serve his own interests. So when you read his life, you see that he gets <coughs> consulted all the time by other princes and magnates. Now in return, you see they support him. Uh, so they have their own serfs, you know, build monasteries for him. And so by the time he died, unlike all the other sect leaders, he had this whole network of monasteries all across India. And so you see, if you're a young lad and you feel a spiritual vocation, you know, why look further, you know, around the corner you have this Buddhist monastery, you go there. So very soon in magnitude, the Buddhist order completely dwarfed all the others which results also in a higher quality because many bright people are attracted to Buddhism and that's why you get this, this entire Buddhist philosophy almost entirely meant by Brahman, by the way um, and so, you see, that's, that's how uh, the Buddha became so popular now, because of the large spread of Buddhism and also after a few centuries when the popular language changed well, then it became important to have a stable, universal language. And so that was Sanskrit. I mean, by the time the Pali Canon was written down, you had the local language which was over 300 years different from what the Buddha had spoken. Moreover, not in the same region. It was written in uh, somewhere in the Sanchi region, central India, not in the capital hospital or Mukaya area. Um, so it's the same language with a different dialect, already pretty much different. Uh, so you take Sanskrit because that's more universal exception. It's the same reason why we are not speaking English. So uh, the Buddhists continue a lot of the Vedic traditions, like for instance the 12 Adityas in the later Veda. Uh, in Japan we call the 12 Ten or heavens. Uh, the god Brahma is worshipped in uh, Thailand as Prom, and so on. So there is a complete continuity. When Dr. Ambedkar converted to Buddhism in 1956, it was the first conversion in history, at least to Buddhism. Uh, because uh, conversion is a typically Christian concept, where you have to burn what you worship where you have to completely break with your past religion, that didn't exist in Hinduism. You could embrace Buddhism, but that made no difference at all to your past religion. So, uh, what meditators strive after is um, what Swami Agehananda Bharati called the zero state. So that is the goal of yogic training, that's what Patanjali calls the seer resting in himself. Hmm? That's what the Kapho Panisha called the highest state. And that state is beyond language, you can't talk about it, you can't formulate it. However, once you come down from this state, what normal human beings start doing is to give an account of it start to make sense of it. And this they all do differently. That's why you get a number of different philosophies, a number of different dharmas. You see, the zero state is the same, but the talk you give around it, that may be different. So in that sense, Buddhism is different from Vedanta, is different from Jainism, is different from Sakya. But they're talking about the same zero state. 
So you see, if naive uh, Hindus say, all, all religions say the same thing, they are totally mistaken. This doesn't count for Islam or Christianity, which has no concept of a zero state. You know, it plays no role whatsoever in Christianity or Islam. But it is true for all these uh, Indic traditions that have the search for a zero state in common. But they give a different explanation. And that's it. Okay, I have one more slideshow, but first you can give objections to this one. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, come on. So I'm sure some people disagree with me. Please let me hear you. So the floor is open for questions. You may ask anything you want, but please keep the question precise. Please keep the question brief and please ask only one question so that my most of the majority of people can ask questions. Yeah. Ask only one question. Is it okay? Yeah. 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 What's the reference you are referring, sir? That uh, Buddha is saying Arya, and it is mean uh, Vedic. Well, um, What's the before reference? I go back to the ancient time, look at modern time, the Arya Samaj literally means, and intends to mean, the Vedicist society. You see, unlike uh, the so-called Sanatani, <laughs> They don't accept the Puranas or the Itihasas, they only accept the Vedas. So they emphasize their Vedic identity and they, they do by calling themselves <coughs> Arya Samaj. So um, the Vedas themselves refer to themselves, or the Rishis refer to themselves as Arya, meaning power of God. The Iranians also refer to themselves as Arya, meaning Iranian. <coughs> The Hittites also refer to themselves as Arya, meaning Hittite. So it's a self-referential ethnic term. So the power of our Rishis refer to the power of us as Arya. Then later, when the Vedic tradition overflows beyond the ethnic boundaries and starts being taken over by others, it comes to mean power of our. It comes to mean those of the Vedic tradition. And so it comes to mean Vedic. That's why the upper castes, later when the caste system comes about, the upper castes are termed Arya, meaning Vedic, because they have the Vedic initiation, which the Shudras do not have. See? But sir, you didn't quote them in the specific uh, literature that, you know, uh, for the term uh, the, where uh, Buddha used the uh, Arya term and it is equivalent to, to Veda. I mean, the specific uh, uh, literature. You are saying that uh, it is been in the convention and that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, that is, the, is there any written, uh, you know, uh, the literary evidence? Of, uh, well, you can start with uh, Sri Kantar Devi's book on the Greek Veda and historical analysis. That tells the story about the word Arya and the ethnonym of the power of a tribe. Otherwise, I, I mean, maybe myself I've written something about this, but I can't advise you anyone else. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, so my name is Shri Kumar, and as a person, like as a born Hindu and a practicing Buddhist, so I practiced Vipassana meditation for a couple of years. And so thank you, sir, for bringing this into light, the new ways of looking at Buddhism. Now, sir, my departure at this point is twofold. One is with my limited understanding of both the religion. One on the issue of God, and the second is the issue of equality. Mm. And when you said that Sankhya Yoga, there's a lot of convergence in Sankhya Yoga practice of meditation and Buddhist way of meditation. They both 
have a lot of common, but in Sankhya Yuga there is a clear mention of God as somebody helping in the assistance of reaching towards higher stage. And in Buddhism the concept of Nirvana is very similar to Sankhya Yuga, again so the outcome remains the same, but on, a, on, the, on the understanding of God, Buddha is clearly atheistic in that sense, not to believe in the personalized notion of God which Hinduism believes in. You can correct me if I'm wrong. And second is the concept of equality, which uh, Hinduism fundamentally uh, built on the structure of caste hierarchy. And Buddhism, and at least Buddha, promoted the idea of equality of all caste. So yes, like, okay. Please my, help me. Please my help second me. power point is about Buddhism and equality, so I'll go into that. I'll answer that in great detail. Ask for God. Okay. Um, uh, I know that nowadays all these bhakti people, you know, bringing God everywhere. Like for instance, they say that the goal of yoga is union with God. Now that's not true. You know, you read the definition of yoga in the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, God does not come into it. So you see, in some other parts of the Yoga Sutra, he mentions the belief in God, or at least he he allows the belief in God for people who believe in God. And he also mentions clearly his own belief in reincarnation. Okay? But neither God nor reincarnation come into the definition of yoga. You see, yoga means that uh, you shut off your senses, your thoughts. So you don't think of God. God is an object that you can think of. Okay? Um, so he's shut out. So whatever you believe about God, it doesn't come into your yoga practice. Um, then, um, moreover, in the case of Sankhya, Sankhya does not believe in God. And indeed, the classical uh, nickname for Sankhya is uh, Nirishvara Sankhya. Sankhya without God. Whereas yoga, because uh, Patanjali does refer to Nirishvara once, um, uh, is called uh, Seshwara, so with Ishwara uh, Sankhya. Um, but so, you see, the ancient philosophers, like also the initial Nyaya Vaisheshika, unlike the later versions, is also without God. So, you see, ancient India, like 500 BC or so, was largely atheist. At least the thinking people, those who cared about leaving their thoughts in writing for us, they were predominantly atheists. Or like Yajna Valkya, who started the whole idea of Atma Vada, the basic idea of Vedanta, um, he sort of makes fun of the idea of God. You know, people ask him, okay, how many gods there are there? So he gives the Vedic number to start with, 33. And then they keep asking, yeah, but if there are only six of them, oh yeah, six, if there are only three of them, or three. If there are only one and a half of them, ah oh, yeah, one and a half. You know, I mean, if, if you read that properly, he's really making fun of the idea of God. And so again, you see in his notion of Atma, God does not come in. That's why, for instance, uh, Advaita Vedanta is very popular among ex-Christians in the West. Why? Well, precisely because God doesn't come. You see, all those people, you know, emancipated themselves from Christianity and absolutely don't want to go back to something similar. So when they hear about Raka Vedanta, they think, ah, Brahma is equal to Atma, so there is nothing outside you to worship. Ah, that's good. Uh, so, you see, what they mostly don't know is that in India, practically all Sampradayas actually follow Vishishta Dvaita, you know, Ramanuja, they do bhakti, they worship gods, they go to temples and so on, and so that version of Vedanta is effectively like the, 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 the philosophical backbone of all the bhakti practices. So that's what Hinduism has become in reality. Um, uh, so that's also there, so theism is also a legitimate option, but atheism is very much a part of Hinduism. You um, said very cursor cursorily about Hinduism and Buddhism, the two religions. No, uh, 
Buddhism is very much a part of Hinduism. And so I absolutely avoid this expression, the two religions. You know, there is Buddhism and then there is non-Buddhist versions of Hinduism. Um, uh, so Buddhism is just one of the many sampradayas. And you know, this all depends on what you mean by Hinduism. So some people think Hinduism means Vedic. Now that's not what it means. You know, I refer to Talagiri again. Um, but I also refer to the history of the word Hindu. You see, the word Hindu originally was purely a geographical term, but not in India. In India they had never heard of it. It was the Persian pronunciation of the word Sindhu. So it meant anybody living on the Sindhu river or beyond it. You know, that was India. Then when the Muslim invaders brought the word into India, it immediately changed its meaning or it got an extra dimension, namely it meant an Indian who is not a Muslim. You know, so you know all this talk by this Hosa Bali and this Mohan Bhagwat. And now apparently I read today also by Yogi Adityana that every Indian is a Hindu. Now that's nonsense. That's not true by definition. You see, by definition, a Hindu is a non-Muslim Hindu. Then later, you, you know, they also discovered that there were Christians in India as well, that refined the definition a bit. But at any rate, it means a, 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 an Indian who, is, who does not belong to any foreign religion. But it does mean Buddhists, it does mean Jains, it does mean Charvakas, it does mean Sankhya and Vedanta and so on. It means the tribals. It means the low caste and so on. It means all the castes that di or all the sects that didn't exist yet. The Sikhs, the, the Vira Shaivas, the, the, the Arya Samaj, the RK Mission, um, some of these, you know, se uh, tribal sects that have recently been recognized as a separate religion, like the Sarna in, um, in Jharkhand, or the Don Yipolo in Arunachal Pradesh, and so on. They're all, by definition, Hindus. From an Islamic viewpoint, this is extremely simple. They are not Muslims. They do not believe in Muhammad. They go to hell. You see, that's a really simple criteria. They go to hell. Okay? And they all go to hell. And whether you're just a, a, you know, a cannibal or something, a, a raksasa, or you are a refined Buddhist with the enlightenment and so on, that makes no difference whatsoever. You are a non-Muslim, you go to hell. You are a Kafir, you are a Hindu. And so that's the definition of Hindu. Now later, especially in the British period, when you have a lot of uh, Christian cultural influence, then some Hindus start interiorizing the category of Hindus. Originally it was used only by Muslims. Later it started to be used by the Hindu courts where there was a lot of imitation of the Muslim courts. Like you had the Hindu Papa the Shahi of Shiraji, like you had the Hindu Sura Rana, that's what the Vijayanagar emperors called themselves. Um, so that is where Hindu starts to purple it, but then you see they really start applying the Christian definition to it. You know, in Christianity, the religion means a belief system. Those who adhere to the belief system are part of it. Those who you know, sin against the belief system get excommunicated. They are not objectively part of the religion anymore. So, you see, Hindus ask me all the time if I'm a Catholic. No, I am not a Catholic, okay? I've been baptized. According to Catholic theology, I go to heaven. Whatever I do after my baptism, so, alas, if you take a good look at me, we'll never meet again. You guys are going to hell, I'm going to heaven, okay? <laughs> but nevertheless, I'm not, I'm not a Catholic anymore. And why? Simply because I don't believe that Jesus uh, delivered us from eternal sin, that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was born of a virgin, that he rose from the dead. I don't believe that. And that makes me definitively not a Christian anymore. Now, in Hinduism, we don't have that. You don't have to believe in anything specific to be a Hindu. Like, for instance, reincarnation. Most people believe here believe in, in reincarnation. Nevertheless, that's not a defining element of Hinduism. The rishis, 
I don't know what they believe in their heart of hearts, but they never speak of reincarnation. In fact, they describe, you see, after death you go to heaven, you know, and they even describe in heaven there's a particular constellation where you go to, somewhere Scorpio, Sagittarius, thereabouts. And, and so, you know, it's a natural thing to do. You go for a walk with, the, you know, your grandson, well, you people don't have a grandson here, yeah, but anyway, with a kid, and you tell him, you know, okay, uh, so your, uh, your grandma has died, there she is. She's watching over you, watch out what you do. Uh, but so, you know, this is a very natural, innocent thing. But so, for all we know, the Vedic Christians didn't go beyond that. And yet, you see, you can't say they were not Hindus. Okay? By the Muslim definition, they were Hindus. Even though the word didn't exist yet. Um, so you've got people like Balaganga Dara Tilak, who try to catch <coughs> Hindu within a definition. So they say Hindu is someone who believes in the Vedas, who believes in reincarnation, who believes in cow protection, and who believes in caste. You see, he was a very reactionary Hindu, very much against the reformism that through the Arya Samaj was becoming better known in India at the time. Um, but so, he, he names those, uh, you could name maybe a few others, but at any rate, like theism, some people think Hinduism by definition is theist. Um, uh, but so there are certain beliefs that some people think are defining for Hinduism, well they are not. That's a, that's a mistake in the <coughs> Um, so, um, anyway, and so Buddhism doesn't fall under the definition because there is no definition. There is only a negative definition. It is not being a Muslim or then by extension and not being a Christian. But so it has a negative definition and in that definition fall Buddhism as well as all the other sects in India. Yes, Nina G. Yes, we can take only one question. This is not a question. Thank you, Conrad. Um, your uh, presentation was excellent. I absolutely loved it. Uh, but in the question answer round, I disagree to with the answer that you've given on Yajnavalk and you. And I'm just going to add my two bits to it. All right. So Yajnavalk, when he writes the yoga, uh, you know, his, um, uh, his, uh, his commentary on yoga, which he discusses with Garvey, he clearly states that he meditates upon Vishnu. Mm -hmm. So he is an absolute believer and he's a Vaishnava. And then he also calls Gargi the best amongst the Brahmin women, his own wife. He's praising her, the most beautiful, you know. So there you go. So there's, um, you know, the Varn system, he follows that. He also follows Vishnu. And the word yog uh, it comes from the root word of Sanskrit, yuj, yujdhatu. So, and can anybody tell me what yujdhatu means? Yeah, to join. To join into, hook into, to to catch into, to lapse into, yes. like, huge, like the yoke, the yoke. Yeah, right? yeah, of course. So the question is, if yoke is telling you to do that, what are you hooking into? What are you I'll joining you. with? Yes. And so, and so when Yajnavalk says he's already hooked into Vishnu, yeah. <laughs> then he is a believer. He yeah. is an yoke in any traditional yoke school, exactly then says the same. It is merging with that which exists everywhere, and then it is defined as Vishnu. Nobody, yes. nobody, uh, nobody merges into Brahma, but they definitely merge, in, merge into Vishnu because he is who sustains, and so therefore you are uh, hooking into or joining with that which sustains, or mm -hmm. you know, uh, and therefore, of course, like you said, all of them with different schools of thought will come and give you different things, and they have different names: Kevalya, Nirvan. Um, Moksh, these are all names, mm -hmm. but the essence is the oldest person, the one of the oldest yoga sutra or you know compiler, Yajnaval himself says he meditates or hooks into Vishnu. Okay, interesting. Now um, I think it's the same story as with Patanjali. In one passage, you know, he mentions Ishvara, but then when he really defines yoga, it's no Ishvara there, and. Um, so there are a number of passages of uh, yeah, of so, Yajna ish, ish, yeah. so he leaves Ishwara. So what is yeah. Ishwara? Ish, ish, that which I pray to. Mm -hmm. So for, for him, Ishwara is very independent. Yeah. So it's very individual. Mm -hmm. So it could be Shiv. Yeah. It could be Ram. 
it could be anybody. So that's why he leaves it vague. Uh, so um, Yachinamalka clearly says Vishnu, mm -hmm. and uh, the other one, uh, Patanjali, leaves it uh, to your own individual. Mm -hmm. Ishwara, Ish, yeah. Isht. Okay, now as for the word yog, <laughs> you see. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so, so yoga is from the, the yuj dhatu, right? Dhatu. We many, have to focus on the very dhatu. many Hindus and others <coughs> that define us to unite. Yoga is uniting with God or so on. Unite and hope. Yeah. And, In fact, and all so traditional schools of yoga sometimes, sometimes has that definition. You know, like if you know, if there are railways and they have junction which is the same root in Latin, Changshu, okay? Then in, in India you will have some translations from that down. Nevertheless, here it does not mean unite. You see, um, yes, you see, you have, a, you have a yoke quite literally. You see, a draught animal is yoked to a wagon. And from then on, you see, he's subordinate to whatever the the driver of the wagon makes him do. And so similarly, the thoughts are controlled. Um, and uh, so, you see, the thoughts are yoked into the wagon. Uh, I mean, just like the draft animal is. So this mind control, that's the meaning of yoga. Yoga means discipline. Disciplining your thoughts. Um, and so you can see that, for instance, you mentioned the word Kaivalya, which, you know, for, for Patanjali is the goal of yoga, for the, the giants also. Now, that doesn't mean to unite, that means exactly the opposite, it means to isolate. You see, usually the mind, the consciousness, is caught into, is absorbed into the objects of consciousness, which in Sankhya philosophy is called, called Purusha and Prakriti. So, you see, that's why Sankhya is so scientific. You know, in, in Western uh, thought, you used to have this idea that every conscious process is part of spirit and all the rest is matter. Uh, so that's why uh, Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. Now, you see, in the Sankhya view, this thinking, thinking of this or that, thinking of some mathematical formula or thinking of someone you love or whatever, that's not consciousness. That's part of nature. Everything studied by neurology and psychology, your traumas, your hopes, your fears and so on, they're all part of nature. Only pure consciousness is consciousness. Now, what is yoga? It is to separate your pure Conscious to disentangle it from nature. Hmm? So it is isolation. It's exactly the opposite of unity. No, no. So, so this is again. Yes, that we can discuss this yes, sure. also. So this is an interpretation. Same. That's why I said the way Same. people mm -hmm. saw it. Because yeah. what exists in the world is again Vishnu. That is, that is, mm -hmm. we are nobody. We are existing in Him itself, mm -hmm. right? So whether you hook into Vishnu mm -hmm. or you hook into pure consciousness mm -hmm. is the same. So if you go to the traditional yogic school. Mm -hmm those who perhaps know better than us, they also say that it is again uniting with God. Yeah, if, you at, if you take a look at any Yajnaval, uh, you know, books, it's Vishnu. But it's, that's it's, my it's, problem with the word tradition. You see, in India, so many people call themselves traditional, when in fact, they espouse an invented tradition. I'll give a very decisive example. You know, you have Everyone, everyone, you know, uh, utters the idea of the Vedas are Apaurusheya. Now, the Vedic rishis themselves never call their hymns Apaurusheya. <coughs> On the contrary, they themselves composed the hymns. They knew damn well that these hymns were not revealed from somewhere up there. No, they themselves, in the sweat of their brow, you see, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, they managed to write or to compose these hymns. So, you see, it's only after the Vedas are finished that then comes the gradual divinization of the Vedas. The Vedas had an enormous prestige. And so people started, you know, and especially as they receded into the past, 
you know, people divinize them, just like you do with deceased people. Rama, in the time of his life, as I read in your book, um, was a human being. But then when he died, you see, people started telling stories and, and so on. He became ever higher and higher until he was an incarnation of Vishnu. So, you see, there you have the real tradition that gets, like, uh, over overwhelmed by a later invented tradition. And so, when people say, oh, it is traditional, yeah, well, um, you see, that's, that's the useful thing about these European Orientals. You see, you, you go on with Edward Said disparaging the Orientalists and so on. I will tell you, I am proud to be an Orientalist. What, what is the use? You see, of course, they didn't know the Vedas like you do them. You know, I can't recite the Vedas or anything. Nevertheless, they read the Vedas, okay? Which very many people in India don't do. In, India, in, in, this, in this sense, Hindus are very much like Muslims. We have all these Urdu speakers who don't know Arabic, they learn the Quran by heart and they don't understand the word. Okay? Uh, well, similarly, very many Hindus, even though they might know enough Sanskrit to really understand what is there, but they don't take the trouble of reading what is there. So, when, when for instance, he comes out again, he says there is a lot of historical information in the Vedas. They fall from the sky, they say, oh, no, 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 it's divine. It couldn't, you know, be busy with such a mundane thing like history. But no, you see, read it, it's there. And uh, so, um, I mean, again, I mean, you know, to, to wind this up, you know, there is a big difference between what now passes for tradition and what really is historically there. You see, the, the Orientalists weren't part of the present day tradition. They read the Vedas with a fresh eye. And that's what's good about, that's what useful about. Okay, shall we go on to the next? Hmm? Who? Uh, does any JNU student have a question? My name is Ayushan. Question my guy. You can use the mic. My name is Ayush. I am pushing my graduation from here. My question is, uh, according to Nishalanan Swami, Sankracharya of Govardhan Peet, he was saying in a speech that uh, Buddha who was incarnated in Nepal was not the Buddha who was uh, mentioned in Rig Ved or the uh, Srimad Bhagavad Gita by Sridhar Swami. So what is your point on this? Uh, the Buddha was not what? Uh, Buddha was born in the Kikat, the Shetra of Gaya. The Kikatish, uh, the Kikat uh, Buddha was the real Buddha which was mentioned. Ah, the Kikatas, the Vedic term Kikatas. Yes, the yes, same yes. Buddhas. Well, um, yeah. maybe, um, you see, he is traditionally known as the Shakya Muni, so belonging to the Shakya tribe. Of course, the word Kikata is a very general term. It may have been used by all these Easterners. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, I mean, he may be a Kikata, why not? Uh, you know, I don't think his ethnic identity is that important. Um, yeah, I mean, about that, you see, I have nothing to differ, you know, with Swami Nishchalana. You know, I'll differ with him on many other things, but here I don't care. <laughs> Even I disagree with sir on many things, but we'll move forward. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, is it there? Yes. Okay. So, let's talk about the claims for uh, egalitarianism uh, by the Americanized. So, Siddhartha Gautama, by uh, birth, was an elitist par excellence. Some people say, oh, it was a revolt of the Dalits or so. How can you say that? You see, he was an absolute elitist. So he was part of the ruling family in his own Shakya Republic. Um, so
So he had a princely upbringing. He served as a senator in the ruling council of uh, uh, the Shakyas. Uh, he, um, his father was not the king, but the president for life. That's why you have a republic. So he himself would not automatically become the successor, but he was very well placed to become the successor because he was very talented. And um, so he chose not to be, but he could have. Um, so, uh, yes. Uh, so they had elective kinship, which was an Indo European institution in the Holy Roman Empire. You had something similar. You had many dukes and earls and all kinds of noblemen. Uh, he's trying to get this, uh, this thing straight. Okay. And so seven among them were the core first of the electors. So when the emperor died, those seven chose from among them a new uh, emperor. Whose son would not automatically become the emperor. You see, if this emperor was the Earl of, let's say, Württemberg, then his son would indeed become the Earl of Württemberg, but he would not automatically become the emperor because one of the seven would then elect a new emperor, right? So that's essentially the system that already existed in the Shakya Republic. Um, so the Buddha had grown up in this system, essentially, he tries to reapply it when he founds his monastic order. There is not full equality there, in the sense that seniority plays a big role. You see, people who are ordained earlier have a certain superiority vis-a-vis -vis those who came later. But, you see, among religion founders, he's probably the one who pays the most attention to some kind of democracy. The word Arya, we've already discussed it, uh, meant noble, and noble originally in the sense of aristocrat. And so we will see that in his day, he doesn't have the general, you know, metaphorical sense of uh, morally noble. No, it has the original sense of aristocrat. Um, so, while this is something we've just... Uh, so Arya also means Vedic, uh, which you know was very much his concern. Like for instance, uh, in the Mahavraga 1.245, he um, he names the uh, the seven rishis, and so he praises the Vedas. Though at the same time, he also says that in his day people are abusing the Vedas. Which is more or less what, what you know, our realistic situation. The Vedas have become very big, and so you could easily, you know, bank on them, you know, build on them, profit from them, if you were associated with them. Uh, but so he, his position is back to the Vedas, just like with the Arya Samaj. And that's a very common thing in the history of religion, also in Christianity, in Islam that people think, you see, oh, our generation has become sloppy, let's go back to the rules. About caste, you see, some later Buddhist thinkers polemicize against caste. Dharmakirti was more than a thousand years after the Buddha. By that time, Hindu society had changed a lot, had become a lot more casteist than in the days of the Buddha. What did the Buddha himself say? <coughs> okay, so um, the scholar Luis Gomez points out that the word Arya is subject to ambiguities, as he very carefully calls it. The Buddha said, what the noble ones say is the truth, what the others say is not true. And why is this? The noble ones understand things as they are, the common folk don't understand. Furthermore, these are called noble truths because they are possessed by those who own the wealth and the assets of the noble ones. So here you clearly have noble in a sociological sense. 
the upper class is no better. As for the Buddha's own caste, another scholar observes, the standpoint which caste the Buddha should belong to has not been revised in Buddhism, in Buddhism studies up to the present day, nor in Buddhism itself. You see, they just uh, register what the scriptures say about that. It is documentized in the Lalita Vistara, a Bodhisattva can by no means come from a lower or even a mixed caste. After all, Bodhisattvas were not born in a despised lineage, lineage among pariahs, in families of pipe or card makers, or mixed castes. Instead, in perfect harmony with the great sermon, which is the, the text about his own last days and death, it was said that the bodhisattvas appear only in two kinds of lineage, the one of the brahmanas and the one of the warriors. Aha! <laughs> and that's why the successor Buddha, who is prophesied by the Buddha himself, namely the Maitreya, was to be born in a brahmin family. This is what the Buddha himself said. Now, of course, we can have our doubts about what the Buddha himself says. The Pali Canon dates from 300 years after the Buddha. So that's like enough time to play around with the contents. They may simply honestly have forgotten, have misremembered, you know, whatever, but so changes may have crept in. But this is the only text we have. This is the only Buddha we know, the one from Scripture. Um, so that's what he says. Um, when he dies, this is a Buddhist context for excellence. You know, when, when those who speak in the name of Buddhism have to deal with other people who also speak in the name of Buddhism. So they are very careful to observe Buddhist niceties. Okay? Now what do they say? Okay, you see he died, he's being cremated, now he's ashes. Well, we, uh, we are Kshatriyas, he was a Kshatriya, so we are entitled to his ashes. You see, if caste was no, of no importance, then even if they meant to emphasize their own caste, they would not say it. They would find some other reason that, you know, with the same effect that they would get the ashes. But so here, they are very explicit. You know, Kshatriyas are like him, and therefore they should have his ashes. So after absorbing his teachings, which he had been teaching for 45 years, they still don't mind caste at all. Another word that you frequently hear in Buddhism is nobly born. So, uh, like for instance, he says in these seven rules of non decline, we'll see them in more detail. One of the rules is that women should be respected. Now, here he says, you know, are women of noble birth uh, respected? You know, I mean, if maid servants get raped, well, that's a pity, but we'll, it's not worth talking about. You know, he, he always, or his followers at any rate, make that distinction, nobly born. And so they were proud of the noble birth of the Buddha himself. You see, he was from the Shakya tribe, which was reputed at that time, to be descended from uh, Manu, from Manu himself. Then, um, so they were part of the solar dynasty, of which Rama was also a part. You see, the Buddha not only claimed to be a descendant of Rama, he also claimed to be a reincarnation of Rama. Aha! Because he, he's totally conscious of reincarnation. It's a complete difference with the Vedic teaching and so on. You know, whenever he speaks about the past, he always adds, and then I was this. You know, it is a, you would be speaking, oh, Shiva did this, and at that time, I was that. You see, nobody talks like that. Well, the Buddha did always. Um, but so, you see, he's very proud of having been Rama at the time. You see, the birth for him, origin for him is very important. Then another element of birth 
is physical marks that he's born with. They are seen as predicting enlightenment. Likewise, like Buddha statues have large earlobes. This is physical trait, so that's deemed to be a predictor of becoming a Buddha. In uh, 1999, the Vipassana teacher, S.N. Goenka, uh, talked with the Kanchi Puram Shankaracharya, Jayendra Saraswati, whom I have interviewed. And um, he extracted from him the one sided promise. It's something typical for Hindus to do. They promise something to the others and they don't expect a counter promise. Anyway, so you see, he promised to give up considering the Buddha as the, the, the ninth incarnation of Vishnu. Uh, in 1956, uh, Ambedkar, upon converting to Buddhism, extracted from his fellow so called converts the promise to renounce seeing the Buddha as an avatar of Vishnu. So you see some secularists say, yeah, this is assimilative communalism. The ugly, vicious, despicable Brahmins try to uh, corner Buddhism by see, seeing him as the avatar of Vishnu. Now, what is the real story? Um, he likened himself to Brahma, to Vishnu also, but especially to Rama. And so, if he is an incarnation of Rama, or a reincarnation of Rama, then the day Rama becomes an incarnation of Vishnu, well then automatically he is an reincarnation of Vishnu. That's not an invention of the Brahmins. In fact, the Brahmins also existed long before Rama and so on. But, um, okay, you see, once this idea starts, the Buddha starts it, and then everybody takes it over. Uh, there is also a story that the Buddha was Iranian. This is about his ethnic identity. Um, he's tall and light-skinned. And in fact, I, I didn't know that yet when I wrote this. There is another description that, that depicts him as blue-eyed. You know, it was a sort of Nordic type. In India, I don't think this type exists, except among immigrants from Iran, like the, the Chitpavan Brahmins. Some of the Saraswal Brahmins here also. Um, so there are some, some communities in India that upon Muslim invasion of Iran came to India. And so there you do find some blue eyes here and there. Now in this case, you see, they also explain this as, a, as an Iranian origin. So they say the Shakya tribe is in fact a, a form of Shaka, which means Scythian. And so the Scythians are the Northern Iranians, the Central Asian Iranians. And yes, on average, they are taller and lighter skinned than the typical Bihari today. Um, it might explain their fierce endogamy. You see, the, the Shakyas had cousin marriage. They married within the family, which in Brahminical norms is forbidden. You see, you have to marry on your father's side from the fifth fifth removed uh, causing onwards on the mother's side from the third uh, removed but so no causing marriage not, not marrying your uncle or your you know, niece or so not, for, not, not allowed but so the Shakyas did that that's why the Buddha himself did not have eight great grandparents like most people he had only four of them because the father of his paternal grandfather had married the, what is it, the mother of his maternal grandmother or something, I mean, it was totally inbred. You see, the great, the great grandparents were married among each other, and so from there came the grandparents, and so the Buddha himself was totally inbred, and yet he wasn't, he wasn't handicapped or anything. I mean, you know, among Muslims this is also very common, and uh, near my place in Bradford in England, you know, the Pakistani community uh, has uh, about 70% of cousin marriages and has a very high rate of children born with a handicap because of this. Anyway, that didn't happen to the Buddha, he was a, a very handsome man. Um, but, um, so the Shakya tribe may have invented the story of 
um, their genealogy going back up to Manu, because that might justify their close endogamy, when in fact that endogamy had an Iranian origin and was frowned upon by the neighboring uh, well, Brahminical tribes. Possible, I mean, it's an interesting theory. I give it for what it is worth. Um, now, whenever, wherever it went, Buddhism always accepted the local social structure. In China, in Japan, in Thailand, everywhere. <coughs> and so they did the same thing in India. The whole idea that, or America, that the Buddha wanted to change society is totally uh, refuted by everything the Buddha did wherever it went, including in India. And it is also not logical. You see, what the Buddha does is to withdraw from society. Now, if you want to change society, you have to involve yourself in society. Moreover, it's a very busy life. You know? If you want to make your own life a success, already success is not guaranteed. You see, some people, you know, when they, they're young, they grow up, and they, they take the decision, I want to make a success in my life, I want to become rich, I want to marry a beautiful woman, I, you know, I want to be a success in my life. Some of them succeed, many do not, but so some of them succeed, but it takes a lot of effort. You have to plan very carefully, you have to have some good luck here and there, and so it's, it's, a, it's, a, full, it's a full time job. And so, you see, the time there is left for change in society is limited. Now, if you want to reach enlightenment, you know, you have to already renounce all these worldly tasks that your, you know, more mundane brothers will do. But you certainly have to avoid changing society, which is a real whole time job. You won't get very far in that. Many people you know, devote their lives to that, and at the end of their life, they realize that they haven't reached anything, or achieved anything. So it's perfectly logical that if you want to change yourself, get yourself enlightened, that you concentrate on that. Now, it's perfectly logical that he didn't care about society. And so, you, you know, when you apply this to caste, it's even more obvious and very clear from Buddhist history. Like Emperor Ashoka, was a Buddhist. He was already a Buddhist when he murdered all his brothers to become the king. Um, and he was a Buddhist when he conquered Kalinga and killed all these people. But he certainly was a Buddhist when he had these inscriptions made in which he goes against popular feelings in some respects, like he prohibits animal killing on certain days. But he never prohibits caste. He was not concerned with that. Now, as for the secular aspects of the Buddhist life, you know, sometimes he came down from his meditation and when people asked him for advice, he gave it. And usually they didn't ask him for spiritual advice. No, no, they asked him for mundane advice. So there we see him as a father of human being. He had good ideas, but he was not always successful. Uh, one thing, yeah, I should have put that earlier in my speech, but anyway, I'll tell you. You see, a very straight form of equality is that between the sexes. Okay, now what was the Buddhist position on that? You know, nowadays in India, I, I read this talk about, oh, the Buddha was an egalitarian, and he finally gave women what the ugly, vicious, despicable Brahmins didn't want to give it. What is this, you see? I mean, in the Upanishads, you have Gargi holding a debate with the Ajna of Valkya and so on. The women were totally allowed to speak up to be rishis, you know, unlike in Catholicism, where St. Paul says that in the public assembly, women should be silent. And if they absolutely want something said, then the night before, on the pillow, they should tell their husband, oh, please, say this, and then he will. <coughs> okay? But so he prohibits women from speaking up. Okay, well, in Hinduism they were perfectly allowed to speak up. Not so in Buddhism. Ah, and here, of course, I make the big mistake of picking Hinduism against Buddhism. Uh, at least in the Vedic traditions, you see, this rule did not 
exist, whereas in Buddhism there is a very clear inequality between the two. Uh, the Buddha refused to recruit women in his monastic order, saying, oh no, this will only do harm. Then finally, when his foster mother gets old and she wants to end her life as a nun, then he relents. And this, again, for a totally inegalitarian consideration, namely he was a nepotist. He treated his family members a lot better than everyone else. So, um, okay, so he ordains female monastics, but on condition that even the most seasoned nun is subordinate to even the dullest monk. Which is why I've heard several times uh, among Buddhists said that, you know, if they had a woman to thank something for, they said, oh, oh, you've done such a great thing, I'm so grateful to you. I am sure, you see, the law of karma and everything, I am sure that in your next life you will be rewarded. You will become a man. <laughs> so, you see, that's a great promotion from woman to man. Ah. According to Buddhism, okay? <laughs> now, the greatest failure, so I'm going to give two little stories and it's the end. Um, greatest failure of the, Buddhist, the Buddha is the massacre of his own tribe, the Shakya Hagya. So, he has this friend, Prasenaji of Kosala, who as a young lad studied in uh, Takshashila University, by the way. And so he repudiates his wife, who is a Shakya. Why? Well, you see, when he was uh, younger and he was very successful as a king, and he spread his power far and wide and so on, he felt, you know, now I've really reached the level where I can marry a Shakya princess. Because I said the Shakyas were very prestigious. And the Shakyas also thought so. And so, therefore, they thought, well, we're not going to waste any of our princesses on this pretentious interloper. You see, okay, he may be militarily successful, but, you know, he's only a Kosala Kshatriya, you know, not, not a Shakya. And, um, but then again, he's very powerful. So they have to keep him as a friend. They can't risk offending him. So what do they do? Well, you see, the... the the president for life of the Shakya, um, like many successful men, has some paramours on the side. And so, with his uh, maid servant, he has a daughter. And so, she's not a Kshatriya, but she can look like one if you dress her up nicely as a bride and so on. So, the king of Kosala is fooled. He marries this girl thinking that she's a Shakya princess. Then you see they have a son, Pirudaka, and at the age of 16 he finds out what the true story is. The father didn't know it, that he was being fooled still. But the son finds it out, and you see then he realizes that his mother is not a Kshatriya, and he deduces that he himself is not a Kshatriya, because both parents need to be the same caste. And so what will become of his ambition to become the king? You know, we were not even a Kshatriya. And the Buddha is then consulted and he says, well, there is really no problem. You see, boy, your father is a Kshatriya, so you are a Kshatriya. Caste is passed on in the paternal line. <laughs> but he disagrees. You see, the Buddha at the time is already an old man. He's like 60 years older than this young man. And in the meantime, society has changed. And by then, endogamy is becoming important. And so it is to that that the young man reacts. Then the rest of the story is that he commits a coup d'etat against his father. So then he has the army at his disposal, and he goes out to take revenge upon the Shakyas. And he does. And at that time, you see, the Buddha is helpless, he can't prevent it. All he can do is to give a sermon to his monks about what is happening. 
And so he uses it to illustrate the law of karma. And the law of karma is this pedestrian law that all the Hindu shop people believe in, namely reward and punishment. And if you do good, something good will happen to you. And if you do evil, then something evil will happen to you. So here he says, well, you see, at, um, you know, at the time, um, well, in a past life, we Shakyas, we were villagers. And the soldiers back then were fish. And it was a dry season. And their big river had shrunk to a little rivulet. And many fish were caught on the dry. And they begged us, please throw us into that little water it remains. And we laughed at that. And me, I was a boy and I had a big stick in my hands. And I chopped them on their head. <laughs> and that, he says, karmically speaking, is why I now have a headache. But me being Buddha, I only have a headache. Whereas they are getting the full measure of their punishment. Okay? And so, so the fish are having their revenge. But it's not over yet. Right? This is his story, but the rest of the story goes on. So the soldiers go back to their capital after their job is done. Uh, it takes a few days, so they camp out on the riverside to sleep. But that very night the rainy season starts. And the river overflows and they all end up drowned. Why? Well, in a past life, they were asking water, and now they are in the water. See? Karma. Um, okay, so that's all the Buddha could do in what I consider the greatest failure in his life. Another failure um, in uh, the Mahaparinirvana Sutra about his death, and the Sata Aparihaniya Dhamma the seven duties of non-decrees, um, he relates the story of the Saktashila. And since you are celebrating Sitaram Bhagavad, today I'd like to mention that this story is uh, told as a historical novel by Sitaram Bhagavad in a book called the Saktashila. So the king of Magadha reveals to his prime minister Varsakara that he wants to annex the neighboring Verti Republic. But he laments that apparently this Verti Republic is very hard to conquer. It's it is. So what would the Buddha say to this? Because we know that the Buddha has all the political answers. So, um, so he goes there and uh, he says very explicitly what he wants. I want to conquer the Virtue Republic. How can I do this? What makes them so strong that I have to make me? And so the Buddha explains, they follow the seven precepts of non decline And I know because I myself have given them these seven precepts. So, what are these seven precepts? The first is unity. You see, the Buddha was not only an ugly, fish and despicable Hindu, he was even an RSS man. You see, the RSS always talk about Hindu unity, unity. No? Well, here, unity. <laughs> so, so the Buddha wanted unity. And, you know, this is the, the secret of a state's strength, that they are united. And how do they get united? Second precept, they have to do their decision-making in mutual harmony. So they have to consult, they have to come together in the assembly, and they have to deliberate until they are in agreement. Not some Western style, you know, majority against minority. No, no, they have to come to an agreement. And then you see they're, they're invincible. Then there are a few more laws that have to follow dharma. They have to respect the law and apply the law. And then they have to become invincible. Then they have to respect elders. And they have to respect women. You see, like I read this. Um, the women and the girls among the Virgis are respected and are not considered of little worth. They are protected and treasured by their parents and brothers 
Husbands and in-laws, kinsmen and neighbors. They do not suffer kidnapping and abduction, bondage and confinement. The virgin men do not lust after and seduce another's wife. Ah. So that makes a society invincible. And you can see the logic of it. In fact, you have the same idea in the Ten Commandments and the law systems of many countries. I mean, if people steal each other's wife, or if they steal each other's property, or so, you see, this is bad for social harmony. And uh, so, it's, it's, a, it's a rule of uh, non-decline that we have to They have to respect spiritual institutes. You see, they do not have to revolt against the Vedas and throw out the Brahmins and so on. No, 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 no. Respect the existing spiritual institutes. Ah, and then you have to respect the holy man. If the holy man, if an ascetic comes by, you have to give him hospitality, you have to give him food and so on. Okay, so that makes a society invincible. So then he says, okay, uh, so this is the secret, now you know. And so Vakshakara answers him just as uh, honestly, ah, now I know. Um, but you see, he seemingly has changed his mind. He says, well, in that case, the, the virtues are invincible. I can't do anything. So I'll have to shelve my plans of conquering them. And then he goes. But, in fact, he, uh, he knows what to do. You see, so he accepts that these seven principles are being followed, that they make invincible, but what can change is these principles themselves. You know, maybe the people will give up following them, and then they become followed. Ah, so how are we going to achieve that? So, um, Varsakara stages a quarrel in the cabinet of Magadha, and he makes sure that it is much publicized, that everybody hears it. And he manages to get thrown out of the cabinet because he's seen as very pro virgin And then the virgins hear about it and they say, oh, oh, this man is on our side. And they make him a cabinet minister in their own cabinet. Namely, a minister of education. Now, the sources do not say what he tells the students. And so a Sitaram well can imagine it all he wants, but after all, the story is confined by a certain ending that, you know, is just part of history. You can't get away from that. And so the history is that the students end up sowing discord among their parents. And the parents don't attend the assembly anymore. And the spirit of unity and, and consultation in harmony disappears. So then they become vulnerable. A few years later, the Buddha has already died. The Magadha people think, well, now the time is right. And so they move in, and without any serious problem, they conquer the place. So you see, that's another failure of the Buddha. Uh, you know, Buddhist uh, apologies have a hard time trying to wipe out this. Uh, but, you know, the interesting thing for us is that it teaches us something about the Buddha's social philosophy. So, you see, he practices the harmony model, not the class struggle model. He practices a conservatism very reminiscent of his perfect contemporaneous uh, person, namely Confucius in China. So you have to fortify society, not by repression, but by observing a number of rules that promote harmony. You know, Confucius also mentioned that you have to practice a common culture, not only go to the same place as the worship, but also practice a harmonious music. Confucius paid a lot of attention to this. Um, anyway, and so you have to share a respect for your ancestry and for your ancestral religious traditions. So, you see, the Ambedkara view of the Buddha as a revolutionary is completely belied by the original sources. The 
Buddha, of course, paid far more attention to meditation and enlightenment. But when he did pay attention to society, he do get a glimpse of what he thought about it. So the, the woke talk about oppression is not there. Talk of Marxist talk of class struggle is not there. He believed in the harmony model, and he believed that not structures are important, but personal attitudes. And he believed in collective decision making. Um, now, our question is, you know, these are all nice things, you know, I, I, I agree with him, I mean, or I follow him on this, but is it as powerful as he claims it to be? You see, I mean, if if the Magadha kingdom, which was becoming ever more powerful, had really set its mind to it, I think they could have conquered virtue even when they did follow this principle. Anyway, I'm not sure of it, but I know that in history, many nice people have lost the war against not so nice people. Um, like, for instance, uh, an example from the 19th century, uh, Paraguay was a really nice country, a very progressive country for its day, and so it was uh, conquered in a very bloody war by its neighbors. Um, that didn't mean any good, that didn't do any good to the population there. Um, I mean, you know, this is a thing that has happened any number of times in history. So I'm afraid that nice people like the Buddha couldn't really, couldn't really go against this. We have a modern example in Mahatma Gandhi, who claimed that um, the Satyagraha cannot fail because it has its soul force and that is invincible. Yet I see many Satyagrahas who fail. Like this, this Goswami fellow who was murdered by Muslims. Um, or, I mean, the entire partition movement. He was against partition. But then what could he do? So, so many people got killed, you know, whether they were Gandhi or anything else. You know, as long as they were in Pak, as long as they were in pure in religious terms, they got killed. So, um, so you see, these principles are nicer than dictatorship, but I doubt that they make invincible. Conclusion. So there is nothing in Buddhist history that justifies the modern romantic notion that it was a movement for social reform. Everywhere, Buddhism accepted whatever social political order was in place. You cannot accuse Buddhism of bringing caste, that's a song Hindus actually do that, saying that it is Buddhism that introduced untouchability and so on. Uh, no, it wasn't more casteist than its surroundings. It wasn't less so either. And uh, so the Buddha himself profited greatly from his caste status. So he didn't invent it, but he continued it. Now, of course, in his monastery, you don't have to notice much. Because in the monastery, people don't have to make social choices. They don't have to consider, oh, to whom am I going to marry my daughter? All right? So, you see, all these choices that have a caste dimension, you are free from. So then it's easy to say, oh, yeah, no caste. Um, so in society he was there and he didn't interfere with it. So as its personal beneficiary, he didn't think of changing the past system. Thank you. If anyone has any question, you may ask. Self, that is the conclusion of Buddhist philosophy. Does uh, Buddha also says that that enlightened self will also have a caste because it gives a path to everybody to catch those emancipations, uh, to achieve those emancipations. So, if does after getting emancipation, one would all, one would be in the fold of caste also? 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, by some oversight I skipped the page about the self in my earlier presentation. Anyway, I'll tell you now. Um, so, you see, <laughs> many people say, ah, oh, yeah, you see these ugly vicious Hindus, they have the self and uh, the big bright Buddhists, they have the no self, they don't believe in self. And so they make the self the, the, the touchstone of Buddhist separate identity. Now, this is a complete mistake. First of all, the Buddha never says there is no self. He says about certain specific things, these have no self, meaning these have no identity, they have no permanent essence. Like he talks about the soul, <laughs> the soul, jiva in, in good Sanskrit, you know, has no permanent identity, it changes. You see, your, the karmic content of it changes. You know, if you have done something terrible in your past life, and in this life you do a lot of prayas, chitta, and tapas, and so on, the contents of your soul changes. Okay, and when you get enlightened, it completely changes, it disappears. Um, but he never says there is no self, why not? You see, for any somewhat literate man, and we know of him that he knew the Upanishads, he knew the notion of self. What does self there mean? Well, you see, the self is nirguna. You know, it's not black or white or red. You know, it's not big or small. It's not uh, male or female. Like in the Mahabharata, there is a, a Greek Sunni, uh, Sulabha, who has a debate with King about the question whether self is gendered. And so she wins the debate by arguing that the self is not gendered. Right? So the self is neti neti. Right? Now what is the non-self? Well, the non-self can't have, you know, to, to contrast with the self, the non-self would have to have certain qualities. It would not be empty, it would not be shunya. It would have to be black or white. It would have to be male or female. It would have to be big or small. Now, no, the no self obviously has no properties, just like the self. And so this is a completely mistaken debate. You know, it's like plus zero equals minus zero. You know, the self and the non-self are identical. And so to make this whole fuss about it is just mistaken. And so all kinds of people entered Buddhism, including people who made intellectual mistakes. Yes? Uh, sir, my question is connect, connecting with what you have said right now. Yeah. Just help me understand when on one side my understanding of Hinduism is that there is a dichotomy, and Hinduism is a broad term, but there is a dichotomy between body and self. When we believe in the rebirth of the soul, which is what Bhagavad Gita talks mm -hmm. about, and on the other hand, the Buddha says not self. So, is this the understanding of Buddhism, the self, is similar to Charvak's understanding of conscious living body? Is, or is there separation between body and self in Buddhism also? Well, obviously there is something that survives the body. In Buddhism as well as in Vedanta. And that remains in place as long as karma exists is the carrier of some specific karmic content. When that karmic content is completely wiped out, then it disappears, then you cease reincarnating. You know, then you are at the stage of Sunya, and there is nothing anymore. Which reminds me that I haven't fully answered the earlier question, namely, whether it is the self or the non-self, I mean, whatever is there when you reach Nirvana, does that have a caste? Well, no, obviously not. Because it has no properties. So, just a quick yeah. short comment. Uh, uh, on the, the point which you made that Ashoka was Buddhist before he yes. entered into Kalinga War uh, in NCRT heaven, it's a very basic text. But in NCRT, they did mention that he adopted Buddhism after the war. Yeah, that's a common European story, it's not true. So are there sources to refer to that he was a Buddhist before Kalinga? 
Yes, the original sources. Um, he was already the governor, uh, I think, first of Sanxi province. Then he was the, the war leader in the northwestern frontier. Uh, but was he a Buddha? That's the then he was a Buddhist already. He was already a Buddhist. Yeah, yeah this, before he came to power. Before he murdered all his sons and ministers and generals and so on to grab power for himself. Everybody who threatened to ever become a threat, he made disappear. And um, so you see the, the, the not so great uh, Ashoka was already a Buddhist. Then when he fought against Kalinga, he massacred all these people. He was hated by the Kalinganese for this. And so the king of Kalinga uh, took revenge, you see, he conquered Pataliputra and the, 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 the Murti that the king uh, that Ashoka had taken away from Kalinga was had been installed in Pataliputra and he took it back. And he wrote an inscription to you know, sing his own victory, which he put up against the Ashoka inscription. And incidentally, you see, Ashoka is rather famous for having repented about Kalinga. Now, you see, that inscription is put up two, three thousand miles away from Kalinga. <coughs> it's not there in Kalinga. He never addresses the Kalinga people, oh, I shouldn't have done this. Sorry. You know, that's not there. It's far away from Kalinga. There, you see, there he plays a, a nice guy. And even not that nice, because there he immediately also adds, yeah, yeah, okay, so I shouldn't have done this, but mind you, don't try to rise in revolt, because I'll do it again. So, you know, he was, uh, yeah, well. And so the Hindus mercifully forgot about him. It's the British who revived him. And then Nehru, who was an honorary Brit, you know, continued this uh, glorification of Ashoka. So Ashoka uh, gave the example of a very Christian story. You see, uh, repentance and, and uh, you know, making amends, that's a very Christian theme. And so they saw that in Ashoka, so they glorified it. Yes. And you said that Buddhism was quite like a subset of Hinduism. But you witnessed that there was a fierce debate between the Vedic sects and Buddhism for over a thousand years. It was not quite prevalent in other school of thoughts among Hinduism. So how will you justify it? Ah, well, I greatly disagree. There were violent debates with everyone. Uh, as Sita Rangoval says, there were violent debates from the Buddhist side against the downtown. And they are dwarfed by the violence of the debates between the different Buddhist sects. You see, the closer another sect is, the, the more fiercely you debate with it. I mean, look, in communism, we have the Stalinists and the Trotskyites. Um, so, you know, you have the, the Vietnamese conquering the Cambodians, the Chinese attacking the Vietnamese, and so on. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that doesn't say, oh yeah, Buddhism was against Hinduism. No, there were many Hindu sects against one another. And the fact that there are writings in which they attack one another, now they prove nothing. You see, Sita Ramgoel very violently attacked uh, Islam. He never touched the hair on the head of a single Muslim. There is a very big difference between debating and persecuting. And so, you know, as everybody knows, the Buddhist universities in Bihar in 1194 got destroyed, flattened for the buildings and the inmates by the Muslim invaders. Now, this was after 17 centuries of having existed under Hindu kings, who had never touched them, whatever the violent debates. Okay. So, Buddhists hardly realized how good they had had it until they lost it. Uh, so, Buddhists uh, are heterodox, they don't believe in, 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 as far as we know, they don't believe in Vedic literature or Vedas, but... Neither did the Vedic pieces. <laughs> but Upanishads talk about, they take their legitimacy from Vedas, later even a lot of 
philosophies that later came in for legitimacy, they go, but go back to Vedas. Yes and no, because they also attack the Vedas. You see, there you have um, uh, Jnana Khand, which puts itself as an alternative to Karma Khand. You see, it is they who start saying, yeah, these rituals and so on, so a waste of time. Knowledge, that is what counts. That's exactly what the Buddha also said. You see, some people say, oh yeah, the Buddha rose in revolt against the Vedas. No, he had it from the Upanishads. That same revolt is already there in the Upanishad part of the Vedas themselves. So, can I just add to that? Uh, yes. I think that the revolt was not against Vedas per se, because uh, there's this passage in Sammatam mm. Jataka, I think where Buddha says that he has read the Vedas, talking about a certain ignorant Brahmin, so he says that uh, he has read the Vedas, it is true, but he has not understood it. So, I think the revolt is not against the text, but against those people who read it but don't have an experiential understanding of the text, which is the yes. revolt in Upanishads as well. Yeah, I mean, exactly. not, uh, Upanishad has a lot of reverence for Vedas throughout actually yes. and in fact uh, they try to create this dichotomy between Vedic ritualism and Upanishadic yes. discourse when in fact a lot of this discourse or Upanishadic discourse was happening while these sacrifices were taking place. Yes. Yes. So uh, the dichotomy is not, a, uh, it's the, the attack is not on the text but on those uh, Brahmins who, yeah, no, not even interpretation, but those who don't have an experiential understanding. Of yeah, you see, if you if, if you read the text themselves, there is really no problem. You see, the problem with the secularists is that they are so extremely superficial. Yeah. You see, especially when it's about religion, they don't understand religion at all. And so they project what the little they know, in this case, they mainly project Christian categories. You see, what little they know, they learn through English sources, which even if they don't propagate Christianity, they have a Christian bias in building them. And so they take over these categories, like conversion. Where did Ambedkar get the idea of converting to Buddhism? That's from Christian sources. You see, neither the Buddha nor, his, uh, nor, nor Shankara or whatever opponent ever said. So in no. fact, uh, so I yes. think, sorry for stretching, I think that, uh, and I think most Hindus will agree that even like while growing up, subconsciously all of us had this understanding that Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, Hinduism were almost one. We didn't actually see them as different as we started seeing them after this Marxist perversion entered, like mm -hmm. after we had to go yeah. through this entire perverted Marxist education. Yeah. So <laughs> before that, like I always thought that they were all one, they were co-Sanatan, like Sanatan co. Mm -hmm. I think this happened after. Uh, yeah. And we perverted our understanding. Like, for example, um, a case I know from personal people that I know. Um, the Jains, for example, just like the Sikhs, just like the Buddhists and so on, they nowadays propagate, oh no, we have no caste. Which is, I know cases where um, uh, Jain Agarwals made sure, you see, that their daughter married an Agarwal, even if he was not a giant, even if he was, was a Vajra, <coughs> all right? Whereas they don't marry Oswals, who are fellow giants, but they are another caste. So they, you know, their caste is preferred to religion. Um, so, you know, I mean, as one example, we're among the Sikhs. The Sikhs now are very heavily propagating, especially internationally in Canada, and so on. Uh, oh no, we have no caste. The difference between us and Hinduism is that we have no caste now. What a lie! What a brazen lie! You see, all the gurus belong to the Catholic caste. And, you know, all their daughters were married of the Catholics. <laughs> I mean, it was very, very, very obvious. They have plenty of discrimination against Muslim Sikhs, you know, untouchable Sikhs. And, and, you know, nowadays, of course, they're grabbed by the job cast, uh, mostly, and again, the job cast, you know, advocates its own interests and also discriminates against Mazhabis and so on. So, I mean, casteism is, is there, it's completely there. Um, so, you see this whole idea of all these sects trying to get out of their Hindu identity. Uh, well, it's a study subject in itself, but so what essentially it comes down to is uh, mostly that what well, they try to ingratiate themselves with the modern audience 
So now that in the West, egalitarianism has become a big thing, they try to claim that for themselves. But secondly, and I think in the long term more importantly, is that Hinduism as such has a bad name. So everybody tries to say, I'm Hindu name. We are not Hindus. And, uh, and this for two reasons. One is that Hinduism internationally and in secular India has a bad name. And the second is that in India, Hinduism has objectively a number of disadvantages. You see, there are legal discriminations against Hindus. It is a great advantage to be part of a religious minority. And uh, so the rats are leaving the sinking ship. You know, is there any Hindu here? Yeah, okay. Well, you see, the nice thing about seeing all these hands raised, you people are not rats. <coughs> you don't leave the sinking ship, which in the world is at the moment. Yes. Uh so my question is very simple. I did not understood what you mean by caste, because uh, I believe that uh, caste is a very colonized concept, and what we were practicing during ancient times or till modern times, it was a more of a varna system. Otherwise, uh, the bird catching community uh, would uh, wouldn't have created a king like Chandragupta Maurya. Or uh, in recent phenomena, like I'm from Maharashtra, uh, if it wasn't a lenient, like Varna system wasn't a lenient enough, the Peshwas would have never become, a, a, you know, Sardars or the warriors. Or the many people in Shivaji Maharaj army were belonged to farmer or, uh, you know, the uh, ship, uh, you know, uh, this ship, shepherd community. So... Uh, I don't understood like uh, how like what what do you mean by caste? And I, my theory is this caste concept came with the Britishers in India as Britishers came with the economic crisis and due to less opportunities to explore new professions to explore uh, you know uh, new things, the people started practicing what what was their ancestral practice like. My father has said this business and I will continue it as there is no opportunity uh, in the society for me. So that's, you know, that's my theory about the caste. Yeah, well, um, of course the British made it worse. First of all, by destroying the Indian economy, so everything became harder. But nevertheless, they could only do this because caste already existed. And so 300 years earlier when the Portuguese came, it is they who start the word caste. But you see, some, some Hindus say, ah, yeah, yeah, but caste is not one, I don't come. You see, they use the word caste because they saw something that they, in their own country, also called caste. Namely, the division in endogamous groups. So caste properly translates as jati, not as Um So you had Christians, Jews, and Muslims who, in the Iberian Peninsula, were effectively endogamous groups. That's not what defined them, but anyway, that's what they were effectively. And so when they saw this same thing, the division in endogamous groups in, in Goa and uh, Kojiko and so on, where they landed, well, they called this caste. And so there's nothing wrong with that word, you see. Many people say, oh, no, 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 don't use that word, it's one hour, got it, come on. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll avoid the word caste if they really, you know, are very touchy about this. But nevertheless, you see, let's get serious and, you know, admit that there was caste in India. Now, caste did not originally exist. You see, when the Arya Samaj, who swear by the Vedas, say that caste did not exist in the Vedas, they're right. In fact, even the Marxists say that. You see, there is this nice book, uh, who of us is an Aryan? Mm. This is by uh, four or seven Marxist authors. And so one of them, Shirin Ratnagar, writes that Vedic society didn't have the material conditions for a caste system. Mm. So from a completely different angle than the Hindu Dwarabis, they also say there was no caste system. And so the, the, the Rig Veda never talks about caste. 
Um, but then later it came up. We have a, a first very clear sign of it in the uh, Chandokya Upanishad. In fact, so blatantly clear that I think it must be a later interpretation. <coughs> um, namely, you see there, the notion of uh, reincarnation is introduced for the first time. It is very explicit to see that this is a new thing, a novel thing, uh, that they never heard about it. And then immediately it is said, you know, if you live a good life, you will be reborn as a Brahmi, a Kshatriya, or a Vaishya. Yeah. And if you live a stinking life, that's what it says, if you live a stinking life, you will be reborn as uh, a dog, a monkey, or a Chanda. <laughs> uh, I, did, I don't even know if there existed such a class as Chandalas at the time yet. But so that's what it says. So I think it, it's from later, but I don't know for sure. So at any rate, in the Vedas, it wasn't there yet. So Chandala can on, also mean decoit or thief or something like that. It, I mean, yeah. it can't be interpreted as that, a Shudras always. That is true in itself. Um, there is a Greek book on geography um, that, that names the, the, the tribes of India as far as we know them. And one of them is called the Kandaloi. Mm -hmm. Now this root Kandi will find back in the Kand, the Kom, the Gom tribe and so on, mm -hmm. that same yeah. root. So I imagine that at some point, some, some North Indian Hindu kingdom um, had a conflict with local tribes right. that they were defeated mm -hmm. and so that the Hindu king says well we're not going to exterminate you but now you will have to do the dirty work for us um, yeah it's a possibility you know something like this um, now I think that it definitely has a caste meaning because of the context first you see the upper caste are meaning. so probably here it should be the lower caste um, at any rate, you see, we see caste system uh, coming about at the time of the Buddha. Well, we have it earlier, but certainly not more than patrilineal caste. Mm -hmm. so we have a famous example, the union between Parashara and Satyavati. Mm -hmm. So, you see this uh, sage, Parashara, descendant of the famous Lady Krishna Vasishta. Mm -hmm. Um, he is crossing the river, or he wants to cross the river, and so he gets a ferry uh, from this ferry maiden uh, called Satyavati. And so in the middle of the river, they fall in love, and they stop at an island in the river <coughs> to make love. And the result is this boy who becomes Veda Vyasa. Now Veda Vyasa is the saint par excellence. It's for him that you celebrate Guru Purnima. Yeah. And yet he's from a mixed union. So, uh, so at that time there were no concept of mixed unions. You see, the father was a sage, he became a sage, and whatever the mother was. And so the Buddha also <coughs> still thinks in those terms when he has this problem with Viludaka. But Viludaka doesn't accept it anymore, so you see, endogamy is coming into being. But first among the aristocracy. Now here genetics comes in. The geneticists say, and I mean it's a young science, it's not definitive, but it's an interesting indication that um, the division of Hindu society in box type separate groups uh, is detectable from about 200 AD. So it starts at the top and then gradually it spreads mm -hmm. and then everybody starts growing. But so caste is a by Indian standards, a relatively young affair. And so this is again where this invented tradition comes in. <coughs> you see people like uh, the Shankaracharya and Govardhan um, will say, oh, it's part of Hindu tradition. No, it is not. You see, it has become part of Hindu tradition, but you can perfectly have Hindu tradition without it. So, I mean, I know some expatriates in new communities that don't have caste anymore, <laughs> or at least as far as a foreigner is allowed to see, um, namely in Holland. 
you know, they, they were Bhojpuri Hindus, you know, worshipping the Ramsha Imams. And they went to Suriname in maybe 140 years ago. They spent time there and then in 1975 when Suriname was forced to become independent, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't want independence, so they used their Dutch passport to quickly go to hold before it was too late. And so there are a big community there and they haven't gone. And they're still very much in So you see, you can have Hinduism without caste, but so certain re reactionaries keep, you know, holding fast and to caste. Their numbers are becoming less and less and less, but they are now far more vocal because of the social media. <laughs> they're very vocal on Twitter and so, so you meet them everywhere, even though numerically they're not that important anymore. So, so can I ask? That was the last question. That was the last question. has given us a lot for a food for thought. Yeah. And we can have agreements and disagreements with him, but the Sambad continues from here, outside the hall. Correct. I request Chirag Dhankarji, Bachelor student in Pashto Language and School of Languages, Literature and Cultural Studies, Valmiki Study Circles convener, to deliver the formal vote of thanks. The event will conclude with the singing of our national song. <coughs> Thank you, Kunalji. On behalf of Almighty Study Circle JNU, I extend gratitude to Dr. Kornar Els for an enlightening session today. <coughs> we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for taking time out of your busy schedule to be our guest speaker today. We cannot thank you enough for the gracing our event, uh, demystifying the topic and sharing your expertise in the field. I would also like uh, to thank our audience for being a part of this Samad and making this conversation meaningful. A big shout out to Valmiki Study Circle volunteers Riya Shahji, Kunalji, Shambhavi Ji, Somya Ji, Anil Ji, Utkarsh Ji, Manish Ji, Satyam Ji, Pushkar Ji, Arsh Ji, Sagar Ji, Sudhakar Ji, Ayush Ji, Raj Ji and Nishita Ji. Thank you for being just one call away. I would like to formally conclude the session for the today but the Samad begins. From here, then they were. Thank you, everyone. Please, please stand up for national defense. Thank you. Bande Mataram Bande Mataram Sujala Shamala Mataram Vande Mataram Subra Jyotsa Ulakita Yamini Ulla Kusumita Jumadala Shobini Suhasini Sumadura Vashini Sukadam Varadam Mataram Vande Mataram Koti Koti Kantha Kala Kala Nina Karale Koti Koti Bujay Dritta Kala Karavale Sukaram, Mataram, Sunday.